The Dr. Taz Show. The podcast, Dr. Taz. Superwoman Wellness. Here's Dr. Taz. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Superwoman Wellness, where you know that I am determined to bring you back to your superpower itself. Joining me today is just the woman to help us do that. I have herbalist Rosalie de la Forette. I almost got the French, not quite yet, but I'm going to call her Rosalie the rest of, rest of the way through. She is passionate about helping people discover the world of herbalism and natural health. Her teachings make herbs simple and practical for everyone. She's the education director at Learning Herbs and a registered herbalist with the American Herbalist Guild. Rosalie is the author of The Alchemy of Herbs, transforming everyday ingredients into foods and remedies that heal as well as apothecary, the alchemy of herbs, video companion, and the online courses, the taste of herbs and herbal cold care. Welcome to the show, Rosalie. Thank you for bearing with me as we have some tech issues, but thank you for being here. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we were digging into why you became an herbalist and maybe explain to everybody what the importance of herbalism is and and what an herbalist can do for us as we're all on this journey and this pursuit to really finding our best selves. Absolutely. Well, I kind of got thrown headfirst into herbalism in my early 20s. I was uh, diagnosed with a very rare autoimmune disease. And from the get-go, Western medicine didn't have any solutions for me. In fact, they gave me a very terrible prognosis. They said um, I could take steroids, but that you know wasn't really going to help long-term and that I would have a declining quality of life until around 40, which was the expected the life expectancy for that disease. So pretty early on in that process, I was recognized that Western medicine didn't have answers and start, I started searching for answers elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And I worked with a lot of wonderful practitioners and, um, you know, from acupuncturists to herbalists, naturopaths. And one thing that really struck me as I kind of left the world of Western medicine in that particular situation was that people, the, the practitioners I saw cared less about my diagnosis. Like I wanted to tell them like, oh, I have this rare autoimmune disease. And they were kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But who are you? And they wanted to get to know me and like what my life was like. And one thing that I found really fascinating was getting to know me through energetics, through systems that are found like in traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurveda or um, and also in traditional Western herbalism. Mm-hmm. So they wanted to know things like, um, you know, like the kind of holistic questions you might anticipate, like what is my digestion like and how do I sleep and that sort of things, which are all very important. They also wanted to know like, how do I feel? You know, do I feel hot? Do I feel cold? Um, do I notice ver- different temperatures in my body? Like, do I have cold hands and feet versus the rest of my body? And the wanting to know all of these, you know, those types of questions. And I found that to be really fascinating. And they ultimately had answers for me that I wasn't able to find with that particular illness within Western medicine, Um, really looking at these underlying energetic currents. And so having that experience of being kind of like the door in my face for Western medicine, but then having this better experience with all of these practitioners within six months, I was symptom free. Wow. And I can't see that, you know, people often like, what is the one thing? There was no one thing <laughs> that right. I did, but, you know, doing this holistic picture and after six months, not having the symptoms and ha- not having the symptoms since uh, I was definitely all in at that point and, and knew I was already studying plants from an ethnobotanical perspective and getting to know plants in the field and uh, working with them as foods and baskets, that sort of thing. But at that point I was really like, oh, I want to be a clinical herbalist and really help people who have chronic issues, who are also being told, I'm sorry, there's no answers for you. And the reality was, I mean, it was so eye-opening for me that there's lots of answers out there. Yeah. I think it's so funny. My story is the same of like sort of being told that, you know, there aren't answers or if there are answers, they're pharmaceuticals and they have a lot of side effects that didn't work with me. It's so funny how so many of us enter the field because of our own personal journey and personal experience. So what healed you? Like, is it, and explain a little bit about the connection of plant-based medicine, herbalism, mm-hmm. and energy. I talk a lot about energy. I love Chinese medicine. I'm an acupuncturist. You know, I study Ayurveda. Those are all systems based in energy, quite honestly. Link it to plants for us, you know, and, mm-hmm. and talk to us about what that connection is. Mm-hmm. Well, definitely for me, it always begins with getting to know who that person is. And 
I think for many of us, when we first get interested in herbs, we might think like, oh, I have this disease. Let's just like choose a disease like eczema. You know, my mm-hmm. doctor says I have eczema. Mm-hmm. I have eczema. So what herb do I take for eczema? And that, I think it's just a, it's a very, um, you know, it's honest. It's an honest question and easy to understand why you have that question because you have eczema, you go to a doctor, or maybe they give you steroids, but they give you like the thing for eczema. With holistic practitioners, with plant-based remedies, that's not really the question as a practitioner, we're thinking of like, oh, this person has eczema, what herb is good for that? Right. It's more, who is this person? What's going on for them? And again, it includes those bigger questions about lifestyle, but also this energetic quality. So we might ask questions, you know, does that particular rash, you know, is it, does it look red? Does it have, does it feel hot? Does it look dry or is it weeping? You know, does it have a moisture element to it? And we would take that into consideration with the whole person, not just that rash. And we can use herbs to help us balance that energetic that's going on. And for me, I love the, I love how sophisticated it is, but also how basic it is and how so many of us already practice this. Like, you know, on a hot summer's day, are we thinking like, oh, it's sweltering, I'm parched. What I really want is a hot bowl of chili. Mm -hmm. Um, or hot bowl of soup. Like, no, probably not. Right. We're thinking like, we want the ice cold lemonade. We want the watermelon. Um, you know, we just instinctively are reaching for something to cool us down versus the same thing. If we're cold, we're not really, we're shivering and we just like, can't warm up. We're not thinking like, Oh, I really want is a bowl of ice cream right now. (laughs) Right. We're thinking like, no, I want that hot tea or that hot soup. So in like, it's barest essential form that's basically what herbal medicine can do. And there's just so many applications for that. You know, like one thing that I frequently saw in practice was digestive issues. And Mm -hmm. that again, you know, like there's so many different digestive issues out there, but it isn't about finding that one particular herb, but looking, you know, does somebody have cold digestion and do they need to warm up? Um, You know, something like ginger, I think, you know, ginger, garlic, these things that we can all taste and feel the spiciness and we can actually feel it warm up in our bodies. You know, is that something that's going to help regulate that system? Or does that person have a lot of heat in their digestive system and they actually need something more soothing and cooling, say aloe or marshmallow to help, you know, calm things down? Interesting. So when you're assessing somebody for herbs, like, is it historical, like their history that brings you to hot or cold or warm or some of these things that you're using to diagnose or is it like in Chinese medicine where you're doing face and tongue you know readings like what are sort of the diagnostic tools you'll look at you know to kind of make and are those the three main distinctions like hot warm cold are those kind of like the three main places that you focus Mm -hmm. um so now I'm mainly a teacher and so what I teach people is to look at the four qualities, which are hot and cold and damp and dry. Ah, And um, and it's kind of like determining hot or cold and determining damp or dry. And then understanding, it's kind of like getting those basics and then understanding that like, as we are a part of nature, there is nothing static and there's no, like, we aren't just one or the other. We're always everything. We're just looking at how we might manifest as being, you know, more warm or more cool, um, more dry or more moist. And so those things we talked about, you know, how we feel is a big part of it. And sometimes, you know, for people who tend to be very warm or very cold, it's very obvious because they know like, oh, I'm the person who's in the t-shirt while everyone else has their sweater on or vice versa. Um, The closer someone is to neutral, the more they have to pay attention. But I almost think that that is a gift because then you have to really get specific and really tune into how you feel. Because if you're not overtly warm or overtly cool, then you just, yeah, you have to pay more close attention to see how you are feeling. And same with um, cold or not cold, but damp and dry. It can be how you feel. Some people who are very dry, they just know like no matter how much lotion they put on their, you know, their skin likes to get scaly or, Mm -hmm. or they know that they don't like lotion because their skin is already moist. Um, So those are some indications. And then of course, we're always being influenced by external forces. So we need to take that into consideration as well. Um, you know, if we're in, if we're in a hundred degree weather, that is a hundred percent humidity, we're obviously going to be feeling that dampness and it's going to be affecting us versus like if we're in the desert and hot and dry. So we take all of that into consideration. And again, it's kind of like, it's so, it can be so basic in that where it really is about reaching for a watermelon when you're hot, 
but then mm-hmm. it's these like deeper and deeper levels. And you mentioned Chinese medicine, mm-hmm. you know, practitioners of Chinese medicine, they go to school often for eight years, at least looking at these different energetic patterns that are then tied to organ systems. So it can yeah. get very complex and very sophisticated and lots of amazing things can be done in that avenue. But for your average person, I think just tapping into knowing like, do I tend to be warm? Do I tend to be cold? How does that change throughout the day? How does that change throughout the seasons? can help us choose herbs and plants that can help us just get that underlying level um, more modulated and evened out. Okay, so let's help people with that a little bit. Let's make it a little bit more practical for them. So hot, I get if people that run hot are usually hot all the time, probably have a lot of redness to the face, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe sweat Mm -hmm. more would be my Mm -hmm. guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cold, we probably get, probably me, cold all the time running a heater. (laughs) room of you know even when everyone else is like running the air conditioning so there's cold and uh dry I think we understand damp may be a hard one how would you help somebody identify whether they're damp Mm -hmm. well that could be you know feeling their skin it just has more moisture to it maybe they might notice that their hair tends to be more oily um Another thing could be someone might be susceptible to edema. They might just notice that they retain water more. You mentioned tongue diagnosis, which again can be this very sophisticated art, but can also be something that you can just learn the super basics of. And I recommend doing that by just looking at your tongue every day and seeing how your tongue changes. So, um, you know, you mentioned hot people who are hot tend to have red tongues. Mm. People who are damp tend to have a, (laughs) tend to have a coating on their tongue and often, um, like a white coating would indicate yeah. more coolness and a yellow coating could indicate more heat. That coating is a good one. Um, other symptoms of dampness could be um, having like having lots of congestion often, you know, sinus congestion, lung congestion. That could be another sign. What about like edema, like, you know, swelling yeah. in the leg, that's a damp sign too. Yeah, definitely. All yeah. right. So hot, cold, dry, or damp. Now, once we might be able to understand which type we are, how do we go, like, explain the, the plant system, because I think you were going there with the energy of a plant and the energy of us, and what's the synergy mm-hmm. between the two? How does that work? And then we'll jump into different herbs that might be used for some of those different conditions. Sure. So um, when we think about, when I was talking like with people, if somebody is, is overtly hot or overtly cool, it's really easy to say, you know, to like figure that out. And same with plants. So let's take some plants that are just obviously hot things like cayenne pepper, obviously Mm -hmm. hot. If you eat a hot and spicy soup, you will most likely feel that heat, you know, the temperature of the soup. But if there's cayenne in the soup, you can actually feel that warmth go down um, into your stomach, kind of heat you up from your core. And so those herbs, those overtly hot herbs are going to be a wonderful match for someone who feels overtly cold. Um, they might warm up that person and help bring them into more of a homeostasis versus if somebody already has a lot of heat going on, those herbs might not be the best choice. Now, I want to be clear that it's not like dangerous, but just over time, someone might notice like, oh, you know, this is too warming for me. I'm already hot. I'm taking this hot herb. It's not working out for me. There's actually an herb that I like to talk about when we think about matching people and energetics, and that's turmeric, because turmeric is everywhere. Everyone's yeah. talking about turmeric. We all love turmeric. I love turmeric. Um, one thing that often doesn't get talked about in the all the glorious gifts of turmeric is how drying it is. It is very, very drying. Interesting. And so someone might take turmeric, and again, this kind of depends on how dry that person is, how long they take the turmeric for, how much turmeric they take. Um, but if somebody has severe inflammatory symptoms, I generally recommend that they up that level of turmeric as much as 10 grams a day, which is oh, wow. a significant dose. Mm-hmm. But at that dose, you're also risking having that dryness come up. And I've talked to many people taking turmeric who didn't realize that they were experiencing symptoms of dryness. Cause we don't really think of that as like an adverse effect, right? right? It's not right. like, you know, symptoms include, but some symptoms of taking too much turmeric or not properly formulating turmeric, it would be the person wakes up and they like in the morning, they're just like, wow, my eyes are dry or my mouth is really dry all the time. It's like, no matter what I do, I'm drinking, but I'm just dry all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, They'll notice their skin is dry. So like the mucous membranes that will really show up with dryness. So that's an indicate, you know, that's an indication if somebody has a lot of 
dampness, that drying quality of turmeric might actually balance them out. It might be a great match. Um, so I kind of got sidetracked there. We were talking about overtly hot, then there's the overtly drying like turmeric and then herbs that are cooling in nature. Mm -hmm. um, again, we, you know, watermelon is a great example, not often used as like a medicinal herb, but it certainly has a medicinal benefits, the seeds, as well as just that action of cooling us down when we're hot. Yeah. Uh, cucumber can be another one that we can all recognize as being a cooling, you know, having this cooling property to it. And um, there's also a, another a group of herbs we call bitters. And we use bitters often for digestion. They help stimulate mm -hmm. digestion, help keep our digestion robust and healthy. And often those are cooling in nature. So if somebody has lots of signs of heat, having bitters in their meals or taken as herbal medicine might be a great way to just kind of calm down that heat a little bit. Gotcha. All right. So we have a little bit more time. So I want to help everybody listening out there. So as they're sifting through, whether they're hot, dry, damp, or cold, when it comes to women's health issues, what are some of the most commonly used herbs that you see yourself reaching for and for what particular reasons? And then again, I always ask you two questions when I'm supposed to be asking you one, but the follow-up question to that is like t uh, tinctures, tablets, teas, like, you know, what's the best way to take an herb in particular? Do you have any preference there? Okay. Yeah, so some herbs that um, often reach for, for women, you know, the first one that sprang to my mind is stinging nettle, which is maybe the herb I often think of for many different reasons, mm. but stinging nettle is so nutrient dense. And it's filled with just so many wonderful things that it's like can seemingly do everything, but it's especially great for helping um, build healthy bones, healthy teeth. Like I often say the side effect of stinging nettle is luxurious hair. Um, so there's a, you know, mm. wonderful side effects associated with it. Um, but it's a wonderful herb to think about taking often especially for remineralizing and getting lots of nutrients in your life. Uh, another one that I often pair with that is oat straw. And it's kind of similar. It's wonderful for building bone health. Um, so you think, and that, you know, being bone health, strong nails, strong teeth, strong hair, um, both of those are really wonderful. And those are two herbs that could be taken together and they can be taken for the long time or long term. Just think, you know, think of them as being like, um, like an herbal multivitamin in a sense of like, it's just deeply nourishing, deeply enriching and helps with that like a base level. So it's kind of like eating your vegetables yeah, and right. to tie in what you're asking about how to take it, that how to take herbal medicine really depends on the plant and why you're taking it. So in this particular case with stinging nettle and oat straw, those are both these nutrient dense herbs that are filled with all sorts of vitamins and minerals, which are going to be best extracted with water Mm -hmm. or possibly with vinegar. Alcohol, which is how we make tinctures, doesn't extract vitamins and minerals. So you wouldn't want to take, if you're like thinking like, I want to work with this plant for this nutrient dense qualities, you wouldn't want to reach for an alcohol tincture because it just doesn't uh, work in that way. So in this case, I like to take a bunch of nettle and a bunch of oat straw, like a handful of each. Um, and if you measured that out by weight, it'd be like anywhere from 15 to 30 grams each and make a long infused tea out of them. So pour hot wa water over it, let it sit even overnight. And that gives it a time for that water to really like suck out all of those nutrients. And then you can drink the resulting tea from that. Gotcha. So all these things that are on the counter like that are in tinctures, you know, I can think of so many herbs that are in tincture form, you know, and, you know, we recommend patients boil water, drop it, drop the alcohol-based tincture into to the hot water so the alcohol evaporates off and then drinks it and then they drink it or then they take it directly. Are we not getting the effect from those particular herbs or the desired effect? Mm -hmm. Well, again, it depends on why you might be taking it. So for example, um, fresh stinging nettle tincture. So mm -hmm. taking the fresh nettle and extracting it with alcohol. Um, what's that is a wonderful thing for modulating inflammation that can be used for helping with seasonal allergies. Some really interesting studies looking at that, um, the fresh nettle extract in regards to insulin resistance and type two diabetes. 
So in that situation, you know, there are reasons that you might want to take it, but when you're taking it as an alcohol extract, you just aren't getting those vitamins and minerals. So it kind of depends on why, you know, the purpose behind it and why you're taking it. Hmm. Goodness. It makes it confusing. So what is your recommendation then if we are taking herbs, what's the best way to go about deciding what herbs to take, what to buy when we're shopping the shelves? I know you have a couple of books. I'm guessing that there's some advice in those books, but what are like some things that we can do when we're standing at the shelves or even in my practice where we have a lot of different herbal formulas, like what are some things that we should be thinking about, you know, as we're reaching for those bottles? Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely like, I mean, there's kind of a different ways of approaching that. If you are someone who wants to work with a practitioner and then, you know, use their experience and advice to help you choose something, then that's a great way to go. If you're thinking like, oh, I really want to know more about these herbs. I really want to help choose the herbs I want to take. Then I really like getting to know herbs one at a time. Because we just looked at, you know, stinging nettle, which we could talk for hours about all the wonderful gifts that it has. And there's different ways to prepare it. Um, which like you said, immediately it's like, whoa, this can get overwhelming fast. So it's nice to kind of like simplify that a bit and get to know one plant. And um, people who are interested in herbal medicine, I I often ask them like, is there a plant that you're interested in? And people often have that like quick response, like, oh yeah, I've been wondering about this. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would start there and get to know that plant. It's It's really, there's so many layers to all of the gifts and benefits of herbs that you, you can get to know it and then go deeper and deeper, um, getting to know not only, you know, what it's used for, but you, then you can look at how was this used in the past? How, what are studies that are being used mm-hmm. today that are showing us information? How is it prepared? How are the different ways it's prepared? Um, another herb we could talk about, for example, is chamomile. Mm-hmm. For years, I completely discounted chamomile. I thought it was like, you know, for rabbits who were in gardens and had a stressful day, right? It's like Peter Rabbit. Um, and so I kind of discounted it for a long time. And I think for a long time too, I just thought of chamomile as being like a tea bag that you like dip in the water a little bit and then you drink yeah. it. And sure, it made a pleasant tea, but like if you had a serious issue, you aren't going to go to chamomile. Right. Um, I have, I've learned, <laughs> as you might imagine, I've learned to change my tune on that one. And I feel like I'm still learning so much about chamomile. I mean, it's um, really interesting studies looking at it for generalized anxiety disorder strongly modulates inflammation, can be used Mm -hmm. both externally and internally. One of my favorite things to do with it now is to make an infused oil out of it and use it on my skin just as like a healthy skin boost. Mm -hmm. It's profoundly relaxing and it's very comforting. A lot of people talk about that when you have chamomile tea, there's just a comfort, you know, like a sighing and ease. Um, So I love it at the end of the day. I love to take a bath with it. That's a really fun way to just kind of experience that nurturing, calming, a way um, to use it works wonderful as a breast massage oil that can be done, you know, nightly morning ritual helps simulate lymphatic flow. Um, also again, you know, just has these wonderful inflammation modulating qualities too, and it can support skin health. So there's all this, like, you could just go into this rabbit hole of right. chamomile and all the gifts it might bring. I've made chamomile tea into popsicles, made it into iced summer beverages. I mean, just, you know, you can go on and on and on, but and that's kind of like the joy of it. Into like a popsicle or a powder that you take later or the, is everything pretty stable? Like how long is the stability and the benefits of these different plants and herbs? Mm-hmm. Well, with chamomile, chamomile is great dried, you know, it'll keep for a long time. Um, well, I guess we can even just expand it. Like dried plants generally last six months to a year, depending on the plant sometimes longer, especially like barks and roots might last longer. Mm-hmm. Um, so they are something that we do want to think of. Quality is very important. Mm-hmm. When we extract them in alcohol, they can be preserved for much longer, which is one of the benefits of tinctures. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to making things like popsicles and teas and stuff, you generally want to use that right away. Right. And a great way to know about, you know, is this plant still good is using our senses. You know, does it smell good? Does it look good? You know, if you're, if you've smelled potent chamomile and you've seen that it has this beautiful color and it smells strongly, and then you compare that to something that's maybe not so fresh and it just, you know, smells like dust, has dulled colors, you know, that that's not going to be quite as good. Gotcha. Well, fascinating. So your books are available. I'm assuming everywhere books are sold. It's Wild Remedies, How to Forage Healthy, no, How to Forage Healing Foods and Craft Your Own Herbal Medicine. And then the alchemy of herbs transform everyday ingredients into foods and remedies that heal. I am so excited to learn more. This is an area 
of medicine that I feel like I need more knowledge. I use a lot of Chinese herbs and Ayurvedic herbs in my practice, but I haven't gotten into like the molecular matching and the energy matching of different herbs and plants with different constitutions and things like that. So it's always something to learn for sure. But thank you for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge with us today. I appreciate it so much. Uh, if folks want to connect with you, with you, what's the best way for them to do so? Oh, the best way is via my website, herbswithrosalie.com. And I have a free herbal jumpstart course on there that shows people those beginning steps of how to match herbs to yourself. So it goes over constitution and, and finding herbs. Wonderful. So that's a great resource. And for everybody listening to us today, I hope you feel a little bit better about herbs and know how to navigate your way around them. And thank you again for listening and watching this episode of Superwoman Wellness. Remember, we're on Spotify, Apple, iTunes. If you leave a review, you get a free bottle of Boost. You just have to screenshot it and send it to hello at drtaz.com. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.